All right, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about 10 ways to increase your income with our good friend, Alan Donegan, host of the Rebel Entrepreneur Podcast. Welcome to the ultimate crowdsourced personal finance show. This is Choose FI. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. guys so we have this equation right what you earn minus what you spend is equal to the difference of the gap and you know you can focus on any one any one of the pieces of this equation we can focus on earning more you can focus on spending less we can focus on all the different ways that we can reinvest that income hopefully to you know increase our wealth or increase passive income the investing you know invest the difference you could be the time that you regain and you could be investing in yourself you could be investing in the market you could be investing in real estate i mean there's so much right this this framework has given us literally years worth of content to explore and many many more before we come to the end, I'm sure. But having said that, there is a bias on most personal finance shows to start with spending less. And I don't think it's wrong because I know we're guilty of it and I think we're right to do it, right? So both guilty of it and right to do it because spending less is easier. If you've been in a drift state for a really, really long period of time, there are efficiencies to focusing on spend less. But for those of you that have been on this path, you know that there is a floor to what you can accomplish when spend less is your only mode of focus. And it's right to point out that there is no threshold, there is no floor, there is no limit to your ability to earn more. But have we ever taken that idea and put it into a framework? So that is the conversation that we're hoping to have today. And help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I am doing quite well. Yeah, it's always nice to have Alan on the podcast, obviously. And this is a a really interesting topic. And it's funny because as you were saying that, I was thinking about my own natural bias. And for some reason on that equation, clearly spending less comes first. The investing, the difference, that's something I've, I've worked around optimizing. But in my mind's eye, increasing income was always the hardest. That's the word that comes to my mind. That's the hardest. And I think with the benefit of hindsight and with the benefit, frankly, of of the knowledge that we've gleaned from this podcast and our amazing guests, I don't know if if I could go back and 25 year old Brad would still think that's the hardest necessarily or that, oh, it's impossible. I couldn't make more. I'm thinking about all the things I used to think like I'm making as much as I can. Right. Like this is my salary. What am I supposed to do? And we've learned so much more and the conversation moves on. And Alan has helped us in so many ways moving the conversation forward, right? First with entrepreneurship. And I mean, that was clearly a blind spot. And this was a blind spot for me. And I suspect it's not quite as much of a blind spot anymore, but I'm going to learn a whole lot more. And I hope the audience does as well. So Alan, with that, welcome back to Choose If I. I am so excited to be here. I love these episodes and your energy. I'm really looking forward to this. And I think it's an important topic. And you're right. When I was, I don't know, like, 26, 27, I was earning £30,000 a year. And I was like, this is the most money in the world ever. And from my 26-year-old perspective, I was like, I am uber wealthy. Now 40-year-old Alan looks back and goes, you didn't even know what game you were in, younger Alan. You had no idea. And it's really interesting. You don't always realise what is possible beyond what you're doing now. And it's fascinating if we start to look at this. And One of the things Jonathan said right at the start about the floor to saving expenses, Katie and I had an experience where we went too far. We got a Citroen C3 bubble car. Imagine a a pink, purpley bubble car with a one litre diesel engine. That's what I was driving around in. It had a dead spot what in is the a first bubble gear. Car? Oh my God, I gotta go. I feel like there's like a Lego set. Like I'd find it in the middle of a Target somewhere. I need to go. <laughs> it would probably C3. fit in the back of American trucks. It was tiny. 
it had a dead spot in first gear. So when you pulled out on a roundabout or a junction, it would kind of like accelerate slightly and then go and pick up again. And it was dangerous. And I actually started like I was okay, but I feared for Katie's life. Like it was a hideous, hideous car, but it was super cheap. But we went too far dropping our expenses at the risk of losing my wife on a road somewhere. And we sold that car and I got something nicer. And I think we've all had that experience where we've just gone a bit too low with our expenses in an effort to optimize. And that taught me I should be focusing. I don't want to give up certain things in life. I want to have a nice breakfast out. I want a car that is not going to kill me. There's certain non-negotiables and I'd rather earn more and really ramp up my earnings than cut out some of the stuff that does actually make me happier. Yeah, it's interesting, Alan, how, I mean, this is a theme. We've heard this from Brandon, the mad scientist, where he, I guess, really moved into that point of deprivation. And he said, not only did it not make him happier, right, that he was supercharging his path to fi, it made him miserable, right? And it made his wife miserable. And obviously you're talking about, about safety concerns. And I mean, this is not what the wonderful path to fi looks like. It doesn't look <laughs> like deprivation, right? It doesn't look like endangering <laughs> your loved ones. It doesn't look like upsetting your marriage to the point where because you're splitting meals or doing whatever that like that there's strife. I mean, like that, that's not what we're talking about here at all, right? It's about finding that, that point where you're content and it's not our place to say where that point is. I think that's, that's the cool part. And you're talking about, Hey, you can change the income side of the equation. And then you have some latitude to change that expense side, maybe even up considerably, possibly. Financial independence is not about deprivation. That is so important. And I read one of those articles recently, which is I quit FI because it was destroying me. And like they didn't go to a wedding for their friends because they were saving money. And I just I want to I want to grab these people and shake them and go like, stop focusing on giving up pleasure and just earn a little bit more. And you can have fun, save stuff and you'll enjoy the journey. So that's the the whole purpose about this episode is Let's earn a little bit more, have a little bit more fun and enjoy the journey towards financial independence. Yeah, I love that, Alan. Enjoy the journey. And, and I wonder, like, what do we have to do to debunk that ridiculous old notion of deprivation is the only way and and sitting alone in a room while your family and friends are at their wedding, you know, having fun like <laughs> that? That's the path to fi. Like, I, yeah, I, I think about these things and like Jonathan and I on Choose a Fi have talked for years now about it being about value of making decisions that light you up, of looking for how can I enjoy my life? And for me, that's a framework of a life that doesn't cost that much. But then giving me, again, the latitude to spend wildly on things that that I do get value from. And, and I just I wish that that old, ridiculous narrative would just die at this point. And I mean, people like us are obviously trying our best. And I hope people are listening that it's not about pinching pennies and depriving yourself. No, I like fancy breakfast. I like coffee with my friends. Like and I when we are first. <laughs> I like mm -hmm. pizza. I like I like food, Brad and Jonathan. Like, let's be honest. But when I first joined the FI movement, I was almost embarrassed to say I still go for a Starbucks coffee every now and again. Like shock horror. I was embarrassed to say it, but I do. And I'd rather earn a bit more and go somewhere for a fancy coffee than I would deprive myself of that experience of being sat in a coffee shop with friends chatting. And that's what I want to get into. I want to give all of the listeners tools, techniques, and ideas that they can apply to increase their income. And I want everyone to think about this as a buffet. Not all of these ideas are going to apply to all of you. I want you to enjoy the buffet and then pick the one or two that will actually apply to your situation and then go and do them because it's the action that counts. And I can see Jonathan smiling at that one. Well, I just wanted to carry the metaphor to its full conclusion. I have never successfully <laughs> gone to a buffet and not tried them all. And I always end up sick. So, you know, there's there's a life lesson here. Don't do all of them. Pick one or two. Show discretion. Pick the ones that interest you. You can always come back later. They will still be there. So, yeah, just carry the metaphor out the full way. 
I love that. And maybe just listen to this episode once a year to give you new ideas to try out the next year. I wanted to add one more pseudo caveat onto this just for people, because I want to just be very cautious of the whiplash that some people might feel with an episode like this and that we're trying to apply nuance to something that people refuse to accept nuance. You know, individual, it's all spent, it's all earned more. It's all spent. No, it's a balance. And, and so the common theme here is align your life energy with what it is that you value. And if you just buy everything, you have no idea what you value. So the thought experiment of going too far is because you were willing to take action and try to figure out what it is that you value. If you can just go to the point of finding out what your life cost, just generally, remove the expenses that don't add value to your life. Actually go to, it's not even a bad thing to go to the point of deprivation because then you know, wow, taking that out made me feel deprived. I should add it back in. That's good information that you didn't have before. When you go out to eat, when you go to Starbucks every day, you don't value Starbucks anymore, right? When you go out to eat every day, you don't value the food anymore. You don't enjoy it. So, so just for people that are trying to like refusing to hear the nuance here, find out how much your life costs, cut ruthlessly the things that you don't enjoy and spend on the things that you do. And now we're at a place that we're like, okay, earning more moves the needle. How do I earn more? Okay. Engage. My wife would be screaming at us right now. My wonderful wife, Katie, she would be screaming, it's not binary. It's not binary. And there's this tendency in human life to think things are one or zero. I either reduce my expenses or I increase my income. And it's not binary. You can do a little bit of both. Because if you increase your income by 15% and you reduce your expenses by 15%, you've got a 30% gap and you have supercharged your journey to FI. It is unbelievable. So it's not binary. Do a little bit of both. Make progress on both. And it is incredible, the progress. You know, we have some math nerds in this community. Someone's going to call you out and say that uh, the spending less is more tax optimized. So uh, it's not 15% to 15%. So <laughs> Directionally accurate. <laughs> you think I'm kidding? No. <laughs> All right, Alan. So you've got, uh, you've got 10 ways, 10 ways to increase income, maybe a bonus. Let's jump into them. I love that. So number one, ask for a raise. And it sounds daft, but we don't often think to ask for a raise. There's a couple of nuances and caveats. Number one, don't do this. This young guy who worked for me, he came to me. I already thought he wasn't performing. I already thought he wasn't the greatest team member and wasn't doing much. And he came to me asking for a raise. My immediate answer is no. <laughs> Why do you want a raise? Because I already had that feeling. But if you know you're doing a good job, if you know you're providing value, if you know that the person you're working for loves what you do, then ask nicely, give reasons. And something that my mum beat into my head when I was younger that I still don't think I fully got is you don't get what you don't ask for. And I think so many people sit in jobs doing what they do for years without actually asking for what they want. Obviously, there's a slight caveat here. If you work for the Rebel Business School team, this is not encouragement to come and ask me for a raise. But everyone else out there, please go to the people who work for you and just ask nicely. Give reasons. I think I'm doing a great job. I think I'm worth this. I've looked in the marketplace. But I just don't think we do this regularly enough. But Brad and Jonathan, have you ever gone to people you've worked for and asked for a raise? Is it something you did? This is a great question and one that I will let Brad answer first, if you're so inclined, uh, Brad. Yeah, no, this was absolutely outside of my level of comfort. I've never, <laughs> never asked for a raise in my entire life. I think I did try in fairness to negotiate my salary when I moved from a public accounting firm to the private company. But in all honesty, Alan, I probably uh, capitulated far too early and just kind of gave in to uh, the first counter offer. And it it's nerve wracking. It really is. You know, I think with what Brad said is this is not a skill set you're taught. And it's one that, you know, we're going to use this as a springboard, right? Think about this episode is we're going to talk about it. We're going to add some actionable details, but we're going to when possible, if it's things that we've covered before, we're going to send you to deep 
dives on these episodes where you can get very, and, and Brad, I mean, I'll give this back to you because of content that we've talked about on the show. We know people have taken action and, and gotten themselves $5,000 raises, $10,000 raises, $25,000 raises. In some cases, this is not something that you should just take for granted or write off. There are millions and millions of dollars of, available for people in this community just by taking action on this one idea. Yeah, this is actually one of the, it's interesting, Alan, that this is number one on your list here because of the themes that keep coming through in the you know hundreds and hundreds of emails that I get from the community, a few things jump out. So one is everything is negotiable. That's just like a, a concept we've had in terms of just asking the question generally, but negotiating salary specifically is one of the ones that people they just are shocked at the success they get. And we had episode 147 with Tori Dunlap and episode 211 with the financial mechanic. And there are like specific scripts and things that you should say like verbatim in both of those episodes that help. And I mean, we've had people, no joke, respond with, hey, I earned $10,000 more, $20,000 more. So yeah, it's very cool that I'm seeing that theme in our community. And that's the first one on your list. You know, Alan, you're saying you don't get what you don't ask for. I'd like to add maybe three to four big ideas that we've pulled from the three or four conversations we had about this over the year. And, and Brad can mention some episodes, but we'll also have them all linked up in the show notes. There's three that come to mind. One with ESI, so Earn, Save, Invest. That was episode 23 of our podcast. That's on career hacking. And then with Tori Dunlap and Financial Mechanic, respectively, specifically on the art of salary negotiation. But the one that I wanted to come back to is, you know, you had this young individual that worked for you that just was an underperformer. They should have known they were an underperformer and maybe they just weren't aware. But I think a lot of us- I even, told them. Okay, they knew. Okay, so it was that obvious. So I think a lot of us don't really know where we stand or what success looks like with our employer. Where are we on the performance scale? And the reason I come back specifically to ESI episode 23, choosify.com slash 023 in this case is he did an amazing breakdown talking about being very clear on what success looks like on goal setting with your boss on doing performance reviews, on requesting proactively performance reviews, on documenting your wins. And we've seen this in other places. Budget Nista has talked about this, having a brag journal. We actually write down your accomplishments. Like, you know, the value you have brought to your organization. And conversely, if you and your boss are clear on what success looks like, and you look at what you guys talked about in your last performance review and nothing has been met, nothing has been done, then yeah, you're not going to get a raise. They're not just handing out the money just to hand it out. But if you're moving the ship forward, you're advancing the, the team's goals, the business's goals, then having this documentation of what the goals were and how you delivered on that is going to make it very, very easy, especially when you layer onto that the information that Brad just talked about with Tori Dunlap and Financial Mechanic, episodes 147 and 211. You're going to be able to not just get, you know, keeping up with inflation raises, cost of living adjustment raises, which by the way are probably one, two percent, three percent. If you're getting a one percent or two percent raise, you're just keeping up with inflation, right? So a raise you know, is going to move you ahead. So ESI talked about how he consistently was able to get 8% raises, 10% raises that completely changed the calculus. So just a few, you know, things for thought. There is a strategy here. It's worth going a little deeper on that, but I think asking for raises massively underutilized. We're not taught about it probably for, for good reason. The people that figured it out, the people that negotiate raises over their working lifetime have about an extra million dollars earned over those that don't. That's on average, and that's based on a study that Tori Dunlap actually shared with us. It's hard to overstate how profitable this is for those that learn this skill set. And it's uncomfortable asking for what you want. It's weird. Definitely for British people, we're not taught to ask for what we want. But I think for anyone around the world, you're not taught. How do I directly ask for what I want? And I feel nervous. And what if they say no? And what if it goes wrong? But that's okay. You don't get what you don't ask for. And my mum would be so proud of me for sharing that with everyone out there. Uh, so that's number one, ask for a raise. I think we've hit that hard, Brad and Jonathan. Let's nip to number two, which has had mixed reviews, but I love it. It's build a side hustle. And sometimes people in the group have been saying, why are we building side hustles for a few dollars an hour and all this stuff? Well, it's quite interesting. Building a side hustle can create a supplementary income doing something you actually enjoy. 
And here's the bit I always find interesting. Like sometimes the hobbies that you would be turning into a side hustle, the things you actually love, you would be doing it anyway. So why not turn it into a business? And one of the things I've noticed in the FI world is lots of the motivation of why to get to financial independence is I want to get away from my job. But very few people have towards motivation of I want to do this in retirement and you need something to do. So you might as well build the side hustle alongside, which is the thing you want to do in retirement anyway, like build it, develop it. And it's unbelievable. You can make good money out of a side hustle. It's just so much fun. And on the Rebel Entrepreneur podcast, we've spent talking about the deep dive. I've done the Rebel coaching series. Season one was a lady called Christina who had her side hustle as photography. She built it. We did 12 episodes and I won't give it away what happened. So Alan, how does someone, because the coaching series that you've done at Rebel Entrepreneur has been blowing up. I've absolutely loved to see the case studies come through. But if someone wants to start with a case study or they want to start with one of the coaching series, what's the best way for them to just, you know, to be able to track someone on their journey? So the best way is to find episode one of Christina's season. And it's just called Rebel Coaching Series. Or the second season with was a lady called Jamie, who was an artist. And she came along going, how do I make money out of my art? I could do all these things. And then you can track her along as she decides to produce a comic book, decides to pre-sell it. And she's doing this all alongside her full-time job. So it's fascinating experiencing these things and seeing where they go. And yeah, listen to the episode of where she launches her product and what happens. It's fascinating. But it is eminently possible for any one of your listeners, like your crowd, your listeners are super smart. They work to optimize things. They do things. It's possible for any one of them to launch a side hustle and to make extra money doing something they actually enjoy. And I think there's only positives that will come as you head from retirement. You need something else to do anyway. You can't just sit on a beach drinking margaritas. You might as well build a side hustle and make some money doing something you love. I would like to add on to with the side hustle bit. It's not just the fact that you have a side hustle that's profitable. It's that it forces you to develop six or seven other skills, which as we go through this list of items are going to be very, very relevant. And we'll, we'll talk about this in a second, but I just, if we keep hearing us come back to this, think about with all the additional ones on this list, as we talk through them, how building a side hustle might force you to develop these skills as well. So just, just kind of a, a pause on that. There's some significant value there outside of the monetary compensation. And I think what's fascinating is two out of the three coaching series I've done so far, they've been learning entrepreneurial skills on the side and they've got promoted, they've got raises, they've got new jobs. It's unbelievable that you work on this thing on one side and then you see success on the other. Mm -hmm. Just from the skills, the attitude, the abilities, like I see it so regularly. And then they go, should I keep my side hustle? I've got a brand new job earning a <laughs> megaton more money. What should I do? Right. Um, but what a lovely first world problem to have. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how that works, right? Just by uh, sheer happenstance. No, it's, uh, it's about <laughs> those skills, the transferability of those skills. And that's not to say that every side hustle is going to be successful in the monetary sense, right? It might be the first of many side hustles. but you're picking up skills and knowledge along the way. And there is value in that, right? And I think, Alan, as you talk about, building a business, building a side hustle is not by any means a capital intensive thing that you're gonna go into debt or it's some irrevocable decision. This is something you can do in a very lightweight manner that you're able to pick up skills, you're able to learn things, obviously, you're able to make connections, you're able to maybe make some money right out of the gate, possibly. And obviously nobody's going to cry about that, but all those skills have significant value and utility. It's unbelievable. And we speak lots about launching businesses with no debt. It is possible to launch something with no money whatsoever and have a go. I've just recorded an episode, which is a lady launching a bike tour on Airbnb of her local town. I'm fascinated to see what she sells, but there are simple ways to do things. And then she's actually doing something she enjoys. She's cycling in the weather, getting fit, meeting new people and earning some side income. She's really looking forward to it. I think there's just a way for any of us to increase our income and have a little more fun. And you're definitely right, Brad. 
most of my side hustles have not made money and I've failed. And that's okay because you learn new skills and you grow as a human being. And that's actually the true value of doing this. Right. And you change that definition of the word fail, right? Was it really a failure when you learned all those things? Yeah, it's not a failure. It's a fun part of the journey. And yeah, <laughs> sometimes it does feel like a failure at the time. Let's oh, be sure. honest. It hurts. Yeah. Well, let's, I want to, the, the actual word fail there. I wanted to, I wanted to sit on that for a second because you're right. Early on failures do feel like failures. And with the benefit of hindsight, you're like, well, you know, I failed forward and it helped me. But there is, you, you do get to a point after you realize that that is just the process that failures no longer really sting as much. Like you just say, okay, this is the process. Now, how can I, you know, make, you know, eliminate out of limits and that, that, that becomes the new, okay, what I learned. So we had something that we did recently where it just did not work as expected, but using the exact process, we're like, man, look at all the information we have compared to this other thing that we did that did work. Now we know where our 80, 20 is, right? So just really there, there's something to that. And it is a mindset shift, but it's a mindset shift that's born out of experience. So we're going through the 10 ways to increase your income. Way number one, ask for a raise. Way number two, build a side hustle. Alan, what is the third way to increase your income? Change career. I mean, this one might be a controversial one, but change career. And actually, it was inspired by something a friend of mine said who was a school teacher. They said, well, I'm just never going to make that much money as a school teacher. Almost like a, that's the way life is. And in my head... I went, well, you chose that career. You could choose a different one if you want to. And I think there are careers that are just not going to earn that much money. And that's OK. If you love it and you want to do it, that's fine. If you don't love your job and you're not earning that much money, change. And I just cannot believe how many times people just do what they do without really thinking about it. It's like, well, this is the way life is. And, well, I do understand it. It's the fear of doing something different. It's the fear of change. It's what if it doesn't go wrong? And all of those things sit there. But if you're in a career you don't really love that doesn't pay very much, change. Find something new. Like You don't have to stay where you are. I am hereby giving you permission to change careers if it's not serving you and you're not earning that much. And I think people, when they hear change careers, they automatically go to like this long, they think about this long, arduous med school process where they got to go back and get a new bachelor's degree, going to have to get a doctorate, going to have to go do a residency and a fellowship And 14 years from now. Now they'll get a second shot at a career and you could be in a totally new skill set in a totally different place, doing something totally different with no experience six months from now, you know, and that's assuming like there's no like there's no baseline. You have to completely start from scratch. There's a mapped out roadmap to be, you know, in a new industry making 60 to 80 K with a clear path to six figures in six months. We talk about that all the time. You got to know that like, this is not over the past four years. We've really started to document these. Anybody that's listening to the show, you need to realize how real that is. So this isn't just someone somewhere can do it. You can do it. If you feel stuck, if you hate your career, you could absolutely be in a new industry with remote work flexibility, making 60 to 80 K just completely from scratch. It's possible. And I'd love to add something you said that I find really important there. People think they need to go back and get an extra degree, go back and get a master's, do whatever to be able to change career. And some careers do require certain things, but there are so many that don't. And can I tell you a secret, Brad and Jonathan? Please. I don't have a degree. I, I don't know how I did. I never went to university. I don't know how I didn't wow. know that up until relatively recently, Brad. Huh? Yeah. I don't think I actually knew that or internalized it, but right. Who cares? I taught entrepreneurship at huh. Oxford university. They wow. never asked if I had a degree. Huh. It's really fascinating. People think they need these things to be able to change career. The desire to self-learn, the desire to improve, that you read the top three books on any subject and you will learn more than 90% of the population. It's unbelievable. Like you can learn anything you want yourself for very little, like the value of a book. Like how much does a degree cost versus three books? I know what I'm doing. I'm going to buy three books and I will know more about whatever subject it is than 90% of the population. Then I'll go and have a go. I might fail, but that's okay. And 
like if you want to change career, like there's so much you can learn yourself. You do not need an extra degree. Obviously, if you're going to go and become a plumber, get the certificate. I don't want you breaking my toilet. But for the rest of the business world, it's unbelievable what you can go and get without having a degree. Brad, I can see that you're a little you're a little stunned. Like it's not that that is like unbelievable to you. It's just that like something about Alan saying that at that moment in time, it makes this point at a level that even though we obviously believe it, it's really important for people to hear what Alan just said. Yeah. I mean, it is the perfect illustration of this point. And I, I don't know why. I, I think it's just that that old script in my head that to be successful, dot, 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 right? You have a college <laughs> degree or you have X degree. And I mean, that is demonstrably false with the person that we're sitting here talking to. And I mean, I didn't know that. I don't care one iota. It makes me think <laughs> differently of Alan Zero, right? Like maybe even better, frankly. But it is interesting how, being perfectly honest, that is the script that I have always had running in my own head. And that's what is so beautiful and challenging about conversations like this, right? And just making you think a little bit differently. I love that. And like, I've done okay. I'm a global business owner, nomadic millionaire and all that mm -hmm. stuff, FI by 40. I've done okay. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't need a degree to do it. Yeah. And degrees can help depending on the careers you go into and what you do, like, don't get me wrong, they can help. I'm just saying you don't need it to change career. It is possible to make a huge amount of money, have a lot of fun and make a difference in the world without a piece of paper. Yeah. If we were going to tack on, you know, we've talked about the, the skills that building a side hustle uh, gives you. Now we talked about changing careers. I just wanted to point people another one here is the word skills, you know, I, I just think about these things as we're layering on again, we're continuing to layer on. Think about the value of having a skill, whether it was a skill that you learned in college, a skill that you learned at your first job, any job that you're in, try to get as many skills as possible out of that job. Don't be put in this one little box. See if you can use that as an opportunity because skills are transferable, right? Maybe not one to one, but they're transferable. They make you a more valuable entity. So those were the first three. Alan, what is number four? Number four is one that made an incredible difference in Katie in my life, which is become a contractor or a consultant. And in nearly every industry out there, you have the people who work in the companies and then you have the people who go self-employed and advise back. And Katie had a very good job in one of the top four accountancy firms. And she looked outside at the contracting market. And the contracting market was paying really well at that time. So she decided to quit. We agonized over it a little bit because at that time, her notice period at her employer was three months, but they weren't hiring contractors like they wanted them now. So you had to kind of like quit on a leap of faith and then be able to go, well, OK, if I don't get a contract, I'm still OK. And to make that decision, like JL Collins would talk about the power of FU money like the decision was made. We had two years of survival money in the bank. Like if it all went wrong, she could just get another job. But she quit. She looked at the contracts. She actually tripled her income and worked from home. And it was the most phenomenal move. So those of you listening to this in a job that you've been working at for some time, you have skills that people will pay a huge amount for. Like have a look at the contractor market in your area and see what is available. Yeah, that's super powerful, Alan. And I know I actually have uh, people in my own life who are thinking about this very decision. And I mean, there are lots of people in professions like that, right? Accounting, law, consulting. I mean, there are millions upon millions of people in quote unquote safe jobs, right? And they know by definition, they're firms are charging X number of hundreds of dollars per hour of their time and paying them a fraction of that, right? And still it winds up being a, a, a lovely salary. So, I mean, that's why people stay, but there's potential here to make multiples. Like you're saying, Katie's making triple of what she used to earn. And I mean, I guess what holds people back is how do I go out on my own? How do I get those clients? Can I really do this? Right. It, it was so easy with that big four accountancies name on your business card. Right. But when it's just you, 
that's a totally different story. Do you have any like just I know that that's a, a pretty deep question. That's probably a whole separate podcast. But like, do you have any quick <laughs> hit thoughts based on on Katie's experience? Quick hit thoughts are number one, the firms that you're part of and are working for, just start asking around. Do you hire contractors? How does it work? Just start looking at what's happening in your own industry. Number two, the recruiters. There is a whole recruitment world for jobs and then for contractors. Just start asking a few of the recruiters that are probably ringing you anyway. What's the contractor market like? How's that work? Do you have any contracts? What's going on? And I think if you start looking and start asking questions, it's incredible what you uncover. But you just need to start asking. I think sometimes people are so focused on their job, they don't lift their head and look around at what's going on around them. And it's unbelievable. And maybe it doesn't work in your industry and that's okay. But just asking the question, see what's possible. And if you're three years away from FI and you can triple your income, what's that going to do for you? Yeah, we uh, recorded a couple episodes, one with Bradley Rice. It was episode 117. So you can go to chooseify.com slash 117. He wanted to spend more time at home with his wife and daughter. So he went to part time, like working about 20 hours a week. Uh, and he's, he works in Salesforce and he was making over $200,000 a year working part time as a contractor. So just, just to take, yeah. Wow. Yeah crazy, crazy levels. And then we also talked with frugal engineers. That was episode 158, choose slash 158. And they, you know, Brad, they were just exactly that point you were making earlier. They recognized the value of their hourly rate, like how much the house was charging, how much they were actually getting. And they were like, hey, we can save our clients money. We work very, very efficiently. And so we can also make an incredible income while saving, you know, the actual clients money because they don't have to pay the entire uh, enterprise. So two examples and probably worth the time of listening, but just know people are doing this just because you're not and weren't aware of it doesn't mean other people aren't doing it and taking advantage of it. You would benefit from just being aware of this if you have one of these skills that would work in one of these industries. And probably there's a lot more jobs than you would think that would work in this environment. And that's part of it. You don't know what you don't know. Yep. But there's this thing like you, I didn't even know. 30 year old Alan thought he was on top of the world making a fortune. And he didn't even know what game he was in. Like, I look back and I kind of want to shake him. Like, you just don't know what's possible. So if you're listening to this right now, just get your head up, start looking around and finding out what's possible. Because as Jonathan has said, there are people out there doing unbelievable things and you could be one of them. Hey, this is Andrew from the Choose FI team. Hope you're enjoying the interview. We're going to get right back to it right after these quick messages. Number five, Alan, what is number five? Number five is a nebulous piece of advice that I'm going to try to make real. My friend Bryce from Millennial Revolution says this is one of those pieces of advice. When you get it, it's obvious, but when you don't, it's useless. And it is the way to get wealthy in life is to add more value. But this word value is nebulous. It's like, what does that mean? How do I add more value? I don't get it. And one of the expressions that has helped me in my life is you can have anything you want in life if, asterisk, you help enough other people get what they want in life. So the idea here is what does your employer want in life? What are they trying to do? Are they trying to build a business? Are they trying to have more sales? Are they trying to do this? And in a corporate setting, behind every corporate goal is a personal goal. So if they want to hit their targets for the year, they'll get a bonus, which buys them a holiday to Disney for their family. If you can help them get that, how are they going to think about you? And it's really interesting. Like value means something different to everyone. So you've got to discover this. If you can find a way to add more value to the people around you, to the community organizations you're in, to the uh, employer you have, to your family. How can you add more value to the world? And it'll be different wherever you are. It's unbelievable what comes back to you. And you add value over here and then someone over there says, oh, there's this job opportunity you might like. Or so you add value to your employer and it doesn't directly lead to a raise, but it leads to some time off or it leads to this or a different opportunity over there. And it's very often it's not a direct like I go and add value there and I get paid exactly. It doesn't work like that. But if you can figure out a way to be more valuable to the people around you, the communities, the 
whatever it is, it's unbelievable what that does to your life. And nearly all the opportunities I've had in life have been because I've gone out there trying to find a way to be valuable. What can I give? What ideas? How can I help? Like we're doing this right now. We're trying to give the audience 10 ways to make more money. Like we're hoping this will be valuable and will change your future. And if it does, you'll recommend the podcast and we'll get more listeners and things happen. And like, there's always this circle of value that happens in life. So how can you add more value to the people around you? Yeah, Alan, I love this. This is, this is the long game. I think about you. And the first 10 times we, we've met, and you still do ask this every single time, is how can I help you guys? You ask us that every single time that we talk. What can I do to help you? And that is just such a marvelous thing. I mean, I know hundreds, thousands of people potentially. I, nobody asks that question. And it's just so, it's almost disarming when you ask. Like, it, it's a wonderful thing. And like, that is, in my, my life experience, that is, you are the only person. It is limited to you who asked that question. <laughs> And I mean, like, and it doesn't, right? Like it doesn't have to be because the beautiful thing is you're not expecting any kind of reciprocation. Like I said, this is about, and this is a theme we've talked about here. It's making connections. It's being genuine, right? If you were being scammy, you know, you either you personally or you generally were being scammy, people see through that in a heartbeat and nobody wants to be around that person, right? If you're expecting a tit for tat type situation, like it doesn't work that way, but you think more generally, more broadly, like life runs on incentives and how can you make someone's life easier, right? If you think about it in your, in your job, you're the one that is making your boss's life easier, right? The VP of your department or whatever it is, who are they going to think highly of? Who's going to be invaluable to them? To your point, who's going to get that next raise or promotion? Who are they going to look to when they have a new, some new opportunity? They're going to look to you, right? Because you're the person that has shown that, hey, I not only want this person in my department, but I want them in a position where they can make my life even easier, right? Where they can add more value, where it can reflect better on me. I know that sounds a little like Machiavellian, but like, but truly the world runs on incentives. And we're talking about doing this in the best possible way here. We're talking about making these connections, being genuine, being helpful, asking questions, and just showing up. And there's a lot of value there. And it does it does come down to giving the value but not expecting a return. And you have to give that. You have to not respect a return. There is an asterisk to this that is you still have to ask for what you want when the time comes. It, you'd never ask for what you want because I've given this advice at plenty of courses. And I remember in my very early days, someone came back to me after a year and said, Alan, I've been giving lots of value. I've been helping lots of people, but I'm in a worse position. And I said, that's interesting. Tell me more. And they'd given a huge amount of value, but they'd never asked, can you help me with this contract? Or do you know somewhere I could do this? They'd never asked for what they want. And it's not a direct, like, do something and then immediately say, can I have this? It's like, keep doing things for the people around you. And then when it comes to the right time for you to ask, you've got all this energy that people will go, of course, I'd love to help you. Of course. Why would I not help you with that? I'll introduce you to them or I'll think about this or there's this over here. And yeah, the asterisks I just want to give to the whole audience is it tying back into you only get what you ask for. You have to ask like there's three letter word ask does have to happen at some stage. But if you add value, if you're useful, people want to help you. They love helping. I feel honored when people ask me for help. So if we were to take the common theme here, which is the interconnected nature of these these disparate you know, line items, this can go in two different directions. So one is, in the new direction, is we are building our network, right? You're building a network of people. We talked about this extensively with Jordan Harbinger. That's episode 233. You can go to chooseify.com slash 233. Dig your well before you need it, right? But the other one that's very directly tied to an earlier one, ask for a raise, is we're building our brag journal, right? So if, if this is add value to your company, to your corporation, this is the mindset that you have, but it's also mindset paired with documentation. And at some point in the right conversation, you know, when you're thinking about why do I deserve this? Why am I going into this? It's a look what I've accomplished for the company and the company's goals over the past year. You're adding value. So I just don't want people to miss that 
And I think about the scenario where you're starting to do just a couple of these. What happens? Who you become as a person? What happens to your income potential? You're a fundamentally different person than the person that just made the hard decision to cut, you know, Disney Plus last month or in the month before. This is like a <laughs> new, like Alan wants to shake 30 year old down because you're just a fundamentally <laughs> different person. And the list will, you know, will keep going from here. And I do not want to cut Disney Plus because Loki is a fantastic season. <laughs> uh, just thought I'd throw that out there. All right. Documented. Alan, number six. Number six, become a better negotiator. I feel like this is one Brad and I could talk about for a long time. Become a better negotiator. It's awkward, but what a skill to have is negotiation. Like find the top three books on negotiation. Find a free online course. Watch some free YouTube videos. Come along to a free session at the Rebel Business School about negotiation. This skill will change your life because you'll learn how to ask directly for what you want you'll learn to understand what other people want out of these situations and how to negotiate and the final thing i'd love to say is your success in life is directly equal to the number of uncomfortable conversations you can get through and learning to negotiate is going to help you have those tough conversations for you to be able to improve life let me ask you alan like you mentioned books like this seems like this is something that's very targeted do you have a favorite book recommendation for someone that's interested in learning how to negotiate there's a ton of resources out there i feel like we're living in a world where it's not because we don't have enough information it's because we don't have any way of vetting it or finding the best information the quickest way to get better at something there's so much there's hundreds of pages of results what was your favorite book on negotiation or your favorite course on negotiation number 1 there is a book by cialdini called influence that just changed the way I thought about how I interact in the world. And influence is a basis of negotiation. Without influence, you have nothing really to negotiate with. So thinking about that as a basis, I would start there. And number two, selfless promo, the Rebel Business School negotiation course is very good. It's completely free, obviously, like everything we do. But yeah, Simon and the team at Rebel do a brilliant job on that negotiation course. If someone wants to do take that course, I didn't even know you guys had that. I, I would go take that. Where Where is the, how, how do you take the course? Just log on to the rebelschool.com and you will see the courses we've got coming up. It's part of the two week course, but just sneak in and take the negotiation bit if you want. Don't tell Simon I told you to do that. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Man. That's cool. And I would give a, uh, a second recommendation for that Cialdini's book, Influence. That book is phenomenal. I read that years ago. And I think he actually just recently updated it and added a sixth principle of, uh, of influence, Ooh. Alan. So, uh, yeah, I know some of these just are when you see them in real life, scarcity, authority, social proof, right? These are all reciprocity. Those jump out. Liking is what we're talking about here. Right. And I guess just to round it out, the sixth one is uh, commitment slash consistency. But yeah, I mean, I see those in real life. And that's what we're a lot of these things we talk about on how do you become an authority on something? Right. We talk about you get people to like you. I mean, that's what we started this conversation with. Right. Like, how do you add value? So, yeah, that's a phenomenal book. I'd highly recommend it to anybody. I'm going to go get it now. Like this is going to happen. Wow. <laughs> I had literally never heard of the book before and um, I'm on it. All right, Alan, that was number six. Become a better negotiator. What is number seven? Number seven is actually like you speak a lot about this, Jonathan, about skill stacking and creating those stacks of skills. This is learn how to sell, which a lot of people listening to this will have some resistance to. They will go, why do I need to sell? Like, what are you talking about? I don't sell in my job. I don't need to do sales. And I know where this comes from. I play the word association game on my courses regularly and I say a word to people and they say it back. So let's play this now, Brad and Jonathan. If I say the word salesman to you, what do you first think of? Sketchy, pushy, trying to scam you. I don't know why those come to mind, but they do. Yeah. I mean, like you could just pushy. It'd be one that I would see. It's just uncomfortable would be another one. Used car salesman, mm -hmm. <laughs> shiny suits, sketchy. And it's really fascinating. Sales has this image of I am going to take advantage of you by selling you something you don't want. And therefore, people don't want to learn about sales. Right. Like it's a However, zero sum game. A salesperson wins if you lose. Exactly. But true sales 
is helping you get what you want and then you paying for it and I get what I want and we both win. That's true sales. It's ethical sales. It's an incredible skill. And I don't care whether you sell or not. It will make such a difference in your life for these three reasons. The first is if you learn about sales, you can protect yourself against unscrupulous salespeople. And you talk about reducing your expenditure, <laughs> like learn how people sell to you and you will be able to resist it and they won't be able to sell to you in the same way. Number two, at work, you are selling. Even if you're not in a sales role, you're selling your ideas. You're selling yourself for a raise. You're selling the next thing you want to do, the next project you want to go on to. You're selling yourself an interview when you go to a job. Like you are the product when you're selling there. Like sales is an unbelievable skill to learn. And then the final one, slightly tongue in cheek, next time you're negotiating with your partner, your wife, your family on whether to go for Chinese or Italian and you want to sell them on Chinese, like these skills are invaluable. It will help you get the action movie versus the rom-com you want did, to see. Did you just suggest Chinese over Italian food because you're a little bitter about the soccer game? Let's just let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> let's just call a spade a spade. Just a little, just a little. <laughs> but Alan, you're right. It's funny because you hear this and you think your your defenses come up a little bit, but it's really it's about persuasion, right? It's about getting your point across. Everybody wants to be persuasive. They want people to to listen to them, to think their opinions are valid, right? Like to, I guess, take action based on what they say. Like, I mean, these are really critical things. So like there are ways to be persuasive and there are ways to not be persuasive. I think that's just a good skill to have just generally in life. And I think you'll see that in a broad array, a broad spectrum across areas of your life, aside from just I am a salesman, mm -hmm. right? Like if it was just limited to that, we wouldn't be talking about it. There's a value in being persuasive. Again, not just to like in a scammy or Machiavellian way, get your way or whatever, or disarm people and brainwash them. That, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about just how do you increase the odds of success? And I think persuasion is definitely a way to do that. Yeah. And I, I think it's really important to say that, you know, Brad and I were doing a word reaction to the word sales, but not it's not a reaction to the ethos of what you just described hundred percent on board. I mean, it is so valuable and it's so important. It, it really is. It's, it's one of the most priceless skill sets that there is. And if you want to insert the word persuasion or effective communication or helping people get what they want in life, it ties back to all the other concepts. It is an unbelievable life skill. Alan, do you, I know we just said it's important, but for the purposes of cutting through the noise, where would you suggest that someone starts if they want to become more familiar with the skill set of sales? I think one of the books that really impacted me was looking at sales completely differently was The Ultimate Sales Machine by Chet Holmes. It's a fascinating book about sales, how to sell. Uh, you'll like this, Brad. He was one of Charlie Munger's top salespeople. And he built incredible businesses in Charlie Munger's organization. I think I've sold Brad on the idea now. Brad has already bought uh, it. It's yeah. like, it's like, done, yeah. click. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie Munger, click. <laughs> yeah. The ultimate sales. Yeah, I'm typing now. Very cool. And it's a fascinating book that shifts the way you look at things. And I think that's part of what we're talking about through the set of 10 ways to increase your income is changing the way you think. Because if you change the way you think, if you change your perspective, you will change your results in life. And one small piece to add here, this might be getting to the stage at number seven where we're, the audience are feeling, wow, there's a lot of stuff here. There's a lot of information. Please remember this is a buffet. Pick mm. one, pick two and start. It's OK. You do not have to do everything tonight. It is OK. I give you permission to chill. You're allowed to have time with your family and then pick one and do something positive. All right. That was number seven. Learn how to sell. Alan, what is number eight? Number eight, become a better public speaker. And I know this is one of Warren Buffett's top ones. He said, if I had to go back and tell a skill to my younger self to learn, it would be become a better public speaker. And your audience probably won't believe this. But when I was younger, I was shy. I couldn't talk to strangers. I struggled 
I remember being sat in a Chinese restaurant and my mum told me, you know, sometimes they have a piano player at a restaurant and my mum's like, go and ask them to play this song for us. And I couldn't do it. I just inside I was torn to pieces. I couldn't approach strangers. But learning to speak in front of people, learning to communicate, like the difference it makes in your confidence, it's incredible. And confidence is that thing that has a magic impact on every area of your life. So I spent, I think, nine years at Toastmasters going to public speaking courses, learning how to public speak. And the number one thing people get out of that program is confidence. Then you can apply that confidence to your life, to your job, to your hobby, to your side hustle, to your family. It just makes for a better world if you feel confident. And I think becoming a better public speaker, your ability to communicate, share ideas, persuade people, it's all tied together. But this skill builds confidence. Yeah, I can I can relate and feel that on a very deep and personal level because, yeah, it's uh, just doing this podcast has helped me dramatically. Public speaking has helped dramatically with my own confidence. And, yeah, it ties into what we were just talking about, like you said, with persuasion, communicating properly, explaining things. Right. Like it does all tie together. But, yeah, that feeling of confidence that you have something to say and you can say it right. You don't need to be run that old script that I'm shy, I'm introverted, nobody wants to hear, I can't speak well, you know, like all of these things. It gets you past that. I love this, huh? When we talk to uh, Liz, who uh, writes over at Chief Mom Officer, this is episode 129 of the Choose If I podcast, uh, she directly attributed public speaking to her ability to effectively, I believe, double or triple her income over a period of time. Like that's really where that was what she looked for. It was a lot of the things that we're talking about in this episode, but really forcing her out of the comfort zone, becoming a great public speaker, looking for those opportunities inside of the corporate environment, you know, exhibiting the skill set as a public speaker to her employers uh, was a massive piece of that. So that was episode 129 of the podcast. And um, I mean, Brad, to your point, like reps, right? Everything in life is reps. So us doing this podcast, we're, we're forced, you know, multiple times a week to come together and tell an effective, concise story over a period of, you know, 40 minutes to an hour and you have gotten reps in. And I know, you know, the first time that translated to us doing an event on stage, we had to kind of relearn it in that capacity. And the first time it translated us going on a TV station and doing it there, we had to kind of relearn it in that capacity, but you're layering on the confidence. All right. You know, no one's going to punch you in the face. No one's going to hate you. It's going to be okay. Even if it's bad, you're going to take lessons, learn, and you're going to fail forward to improve, you know, the next time, you know, it's going to be okay. And, uh, you know, the, the fear, you know, those personal demons you have about not being able to get through something at some point you're like, okay, we will survive this and we'll even thrive because of, you know, that intense pressure. So, uh, this is the same for everything. How can you get your reps in, in a relatively risk-free way to allow you to now take more and more risk? So that was probably Brad one kind of unintended, you know, for you, it really was this podcast forced you to get those reps in. And I wonder if other people could maybe steal from that in their own way. Yeah, agreed. And it's super powerful. It really genuinely is. And it transcends just this one myopic little podcast, you know, like not that many people are going to be podcasters listening to this, but I can say that skill really does transcend just this one little thing. And if you want a completely risk-free place to go and practice your skills, go to Toastmasters. Cannot recommend it highly enough. Not-for-profit organization, supportive audience, They will cheer you and clap you, even if you're rubbish, Uh uh, and then give you advice on how to improve. Like I was able to go there and like mumble my way through a few speeches and like have a go. I was so nervous the first few times. I had huge sweat patches. I was delivering my speech. I was so nervous. But these people were so kind and they just wanted to help me win. And Toastmasters is a phenomenal organization. It's particularly cheap. It's a not-for-profit. They guide you through learning leadership and speaking skills. And I love that organization. Absolutely love that organization. They changed my life. That's amazing. All right. So that was number eight, develop the skill of public speaking, become a public speaker or use your own variation of that, but take the confidence that that provides into all these other lanes. Alan, what is number nine? 
Number nine. This is a fun one. This is one of my favourites. Uh, it's on the skill theme, but this is be a slightly interesting twist. Develop a skill set that you can sell. And where this really struck me, my wife bought me a present for Christmas one year, and it was an Indian cooking class. And it was learn how to make curries. The guy came to our house. We bought the ingredients. He came to our house with his box of spices. We cooked for three hours. We made pakoras and curry and basmati rice. And you know British people love curry. It's, it was amazing. And then he disappeared. And my wife and I had this like wonderful meal, candlelit meal at Christmas together. I learned a skill. I had a wonderful time. We paid quite a lot for it. It was not a cheap experience, but it was wonderful. You know what this guy did as a day job? No way. He was an IT professional, but he'd learned from his mum how to cook curries. And that was his side gig. And he'd learned this skill from his mum, sold it at the side, got to meet people, eat curry and have fun. And I don't care what it is. You can learn a skill on the side and then start to make money out of it. And the one I learned at Toastmasters, I learned how to speak. And then I started to sell workshops on how to do public speaking. Like, it's unbelievable. Learn a skill and make some money out of it. That's cool. And find an audience, right? He picked a very uh, fertile ground there in the British <laughs> national dish, right? <laughs> Oh, if you could learn how to make pizza, you could you can learn how to do anything with YouTube and then you can sell that skill. And it's it's unbelievable where you can get to and you can make money, have fun, learn new skills. I don't care what it is. Learn photography, learn how to speed read, whatever excites you. What's going to get you going? What's going to get you pumped to learn? Learn it and then try and sell it and see what happens. I think people really need to understand that degrees are only valuable in the sense that they're gatekeepers for some professions. So for instance, you're not going to be a doctor if you don't get a medical degree, you're not going to be a lawyer if you don't get a law degree, and you can translate that to a few other professions. In the absence of that, what you need to sell anything to get a job is a skill. And you don't need anyone's permission to get that. And you can acquire it very, very quickly. You can do a two-week deep dive, a four-week deep dive, a six-month deep dive into something self-guided and taught and you can rapidly acquire valuable, very, very valuable skills. And you can sell those direct through the lens of become a contractor or a consultant. Um, you can go work for you know a company, you can get a job with it, like, or you can do it for yourself. But skills unlock the world, they unlock the world. And so then you just need a way of you know kind of matching up ROI to interest and inclination and just figuring out where you want to run first. It is hard for me to overstate. This needs to be the framework that we introduce to our kids at an early, early age. Even if we're kind of finding this out in our 30s, 40s, 50s, you know, as the reality, our kids need to go in eyes wide open because skills unlock the world, develop a skill. All right, Alan, that is number nine. What is number 10? Number 10, increase your efficiency. I don't know if you've known this, but there are some people that just get things done. Like there's some people you know that talk about things for years but never do things. And there's other people that just make things happen. If you can increase your ability to make things happen, get it done efficiently, do more in a day, like my wife Katie and I are incredibly amazed at how just the ability to do things is not normal. Like just the ability to make things happen efficiently, follow up, reply, turn up on time, all of those skills. And you might think you're turning up on time is a skill, Alan. Well, it is. There's so many people don't do it. Like your ability to make things happen will set you apart. And I don't know if your audience ever listened to the episode we did with J.L. Collins about Chautauqua. And he tells the story of how I gatecrashed Chautauqua and then he noticed me doing things. I have ended up doing Chautauquas with him because he noticed my ability to get things done. And that's how I've ended up where I am today is that ability to get things done, the ability to make things happen, to have projects, to have clear next actions, to make stuff happen I don't think I can underline this one anymore. Can you get things done for your family, for your employer, for your community organization, for yourself? Like this skill will improve your personal finances. 
like setting up your 401k and your Roth correctly and all that stuff and following through the projects and efficiently doing it all, it's an unbelievable skill that will pay dividends in every area of your life. Yeah, it's amazing how really what should be the quote unquote easy stuff is is not so <laughs> it's easy. hard, right? Like for 95 percent of people just showing up, learning, being conscientious, doing things on time, doing what you say you're going to do, which should just be table stakes, you would think for a job or whatever. I mean, that is a point of differentiation for people because it's not so easy for everybody. So when you're good at that kind of stuff, just like you said, getting things done right? Being efficient, showing up, doing what you say you're going to do. Like this stuff really, really matters. And, you know, I think, you know, as we look through these 10 ways to increase your income, the theme that comes through is self-development, right? Like these are all critical aspects of living your best life. And they happen to have a byproduct of massively increasing your income earning potential. So don't ignore that. Look for opportunities. In many cases, your best investment will be yourself. It will be your ability to continue to grow as a person and as a human being. So Alan, you know, I I really appreciate you taking the time. And I know this, you know, it's a very dense conversation. I think it's a nice springboard for people. What would your final thought on this be for individuals listening and taking this very seriously? Well, it actually ties into number 10, increase your efficiency. It is take action on one of these. Nothing changes in your life until you create change. It all starts with you. You are the fire. You are the catalyst. You are the thing that builds the life you want to build. And I keep repeating on The Rebel Entrepreneur, the extraordinary belongs to those that create it. If you listen to this episode and then don't do anything... You're not building the life you want. So just take one of these. I don't care which. Take one. Take action. Make it happen. Ask for a raise. Change career. Become a contractor. Just take one because the extraordinary belongs to those that create it. So 10 ways to increase your income. And to be honest with you, we only touched on entrepreneurship in the briefest of senses. But for individual <laughs> like Alan, this is Alan. This is what he he lives and breathes entrepreneurship. He's dedicated to this. And frankly, I'll be honest with you, uh, he's creating a movement around it. It's really significant. So Alan, for individuals that are hearing about your podcast, the Rebel Entrepreneur Podcast, they're hearing about it for the first time. Tell us a little bit more about what the goal is and what you're most excited about you know, with where the show is going, what what success you're seeing. So the goal of the show is to help people make money doing something they love without debt. That's the goal of the show. That's what I've been spending all my time helping doing. The latest innovation is these coaching series, which you can join someone who's actually doing this and building the business. The one that is coming out very shortly, like sneak peek for what's coming up, is a YouTuber called Andrew Alinda. He's doing a YouTube about fitness in his spare time. And his question was, how do I monetize my YouTube channel? And we've done, I think, 12 episodes of him going from never having made money through YouTube to how do you make money? How do you grow your business? And what do you doing? And you get to go on that experience alongside them. And then we've got, I think this week's episode was 10 ways to drive traffic to your website. We've had 10 ways to increase your sales. We've had Zeb Siegel, the co-founder of Starbucks, on talking about how he made the furniture for the first store in his parents' basement uh, to reduce costs. I mean, we have some fun stories and examples to help people get inspired and to make money doing something they love. And I just have so much fun doing it. It's just Yeah, just come and get involved, have some fun, listen to some few episodes, be inspired, make some change and create the life you dream. Like that's the rebel entrepreneur. It's about building an extraordinary life. All right. So you can find Alan at alandonigan.com. Obviously, you're listening to a podcast right now, so you know how to find podcasts. Let me encourage you to search for (laughs) Rebel Entrepreneur. Lock it in. Alan, what is the first episode you think they should listen to if they're listening to Rebel Entrepreneur for the first time? If you've never heard me before, listen to Five Ways to Build a Business with No Debt. It was episode two. If you have heard me before, listen to the ones that are the pop-up principles, the Rebel Business School principles, which is the first two episodes of season two. They will give you a whole bunch of ideas. Alan, thanks so much for coming on the show, buddy. It's my pleasure. I absolutely love being on Choose FI, and I am a huge fan of the support you give to people to help them 
get to financial independence. All right, my friends, you heard him. Take action. The fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled.